Nationalism is a relatively recent phenomenon in world history. The rise of the modern nation-state began about 300 years ago. Since then, many emerging nations have claimed their independence, and Palestine is no exception. Uh, in 1988, the Palestine National Council met and adopted a historical resolution on behalf of the Palestinian people in which this council, which is our parliament in exile, uh, declared statehood by accepting the partition of Palestine. Uh, this referred directly to UN Resolution 181, which was adopted in 1947, uh, to partition historical Palestine into two states. By accepting that, we've accepted the sharing of Palestine and the existence of the State of Israel. The 1988 declaration of a sovereign Palestinian state gained little attention at the time. However, since then, over 100 other countries have formally recognized Palestine. More recently, Brazil and Argentina have weighed in with their recognition of Palestine within 1967 boundaries. Although the declaration achieved nothing in itself, it established a template for the acceptance of a sovereign Palestinian nation in the remaining portion of territory not claimed by Israel in 1948. It is this aspiration for Palestinian statehood that is now, finally, before the United Nations for a vote. Now uh, we are talking about the 1967 boundaries, which are only 22% of what is left of historical Palestine, rather than 44% of historical Palestine. And uh, it is different because we are not unilaterally declaring statehood. We accepted the UN resolution in 1988. Now we are saying this resolution has to be enacted because negotiations have not produced results. And we do need to have recognition of Palestinian statehood, and we need to have membership in the UN. It helps to consider how, um, how to understand the entry into negotiations in 1991 in the first place. Because in 1991, after the Madrid conference, the beginning of negotiations was meant to be, for Palestinians, a way of figuring out the details of arriving at a result that they thought was already predetermined. We know where the result is. That was the point of the Declaration of Independence. It was the point of recognizing UN resolutions uh, that implicitly at that time recognized Israel. And certainly after 1993, when the PLO explicitly offered full recognition of Israel, there was no question left anymore about the fact that the Palestinian uh, representative body rec recognizes the state of Israel. But the assumption was that negotiations would be about how to arrive at that already determined result. That's not what it turned out to be. And I think here we don't have to think of the parties, one of the parties as being honest or the other one being dishonest. That's not how we have to view it. We, they literally did not understand one another. Israel supports two-state solution, a Palestinian state, side by side to a Jewish state. Uh, this has been the policy for the last two decades. Prime Minister Netanyahu is the sixth prime minister in a row that supports a two-state solution, a uh, Palestinian state next to a Jewish state. Actually, two Israeli prime ministers, Ehud Barak in the year of 2000 and Ehud Olmert in the year of 2008, gave a very, very generous offers to the Palestinians that were rejected by the Palestinians. The language of two-state solution was adopted by the most hardline Israelis on the right. I mean, Netanyahu now talks about a two-state solution. Because talking about a Palestinian state in the abstract leaves open the question of what that state would look like. Netanyahu, of course, supports a Palestinian state of his own making, of his own dreams one that looks exactly like how he would like to see Palestinians. You know, cornered, or surrounded, no Jerusalem for them, all the settlements, at least the big settlements, stay. You can divide it into different parts so that you can really keep control over it. Israel gets to control the Jordan Valley. Of course he supports that. What Palestinians mean by a two-state solution is unambiguous. And that's the, you know, the Palestinian leadership has made many mistakes. And Palestinian political 
uh, yeah, Palestinian political organization and leadership has not often been very competent. But you cannot accuse it of being inconsistent. It has been clear, consistent, unwavering, never strayed from the very, a very clear answer of what constitutes an acceptable, the acceptable parameters of a Palestinian state for, for, for Palestinians. A Palestinian state could be reached only by direct negotiations. This is the only path, the only viable path, the only realistic path into peace, into a real peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. No other path will achieve that. The Israelis thought they were entering into negotiations in order to determine what it is that, how, the mechanisms of how they can give back what they feel comfortable giving back, as long as it does not go beyond what they consider to be their red lines. Palestinians thought they were entering into a negotiation simply about the means of arriving at a full withdrawal to the 1967 lines. That led to do two different understandings of what it is to negotiate. Well, actually, there's no such thing as bilateral negotiations because you have an asymmetry of power. You have the Israelis as the occupying power, controlling everything, and the Palestinians as people under occupation. And under bilateral negotiations, Israel used the logic of power and all the resources at its disposal, including its strategic alliance with the US, in order to carry out unilateral measures, such as building more settlements, building the walls, stealing more land, uh, confiscating IDs, expelling Palestinians, ethnic cleansing, transforming the whole character of Palestine, all these unilaterally. So the bilateral negotiations have been used to give Israel immunity, to act with impunity, and to act unilaterally, to prejudge the outcome of negotiations and to dictate realities on the ground through the use of power, occupiers' power. Now, uh, in, in going to the UN, it is important because we are saying that the process of negotiations has produced nothing but more pain, a process for its own sake, buying time for Israel, exploited by Israel in order to create these facts. We need, first of all, curbing Israeli violations immediately, holding Israel accountable, which uh, the international community is responsible to do, and then ensuring that the Palestinian right to self-determination is not being undermined and that the two-state solution is not being destroyed by Israel. I find it very ironic that the Palestinians are going to the UN, uh, to the General Assembly, because in 1947, actually, the UN, the General Assembly, have decided on a partition resolution to divide Israel into a Jewish state and into an Arab state. And the fact of the matter is that the Palestinians, the Arabs, rejected this resolution. Often people talk about the 1947 uh, partition plan of the UN and how Palestinians did not accept it. It's hard to imagine how people living in a functioning, vibrant society can be made to imagine that they have to now carve up their society, not only their land, their lives. They have to carve up the relationships they have with other people to accommodate the establishment of another state in the midst of their country. It was an impossible idea for them to accept. Of course, we can think back now and say maybe they should have accepted it, it would have been better. There is no question that they would have fared better in history had they accepted it. But they would have had to be something not human to have done that, I think. Um, but after the destruction of Palestine in 1948, uh, the focus was how to rebuild oneself, how to rebuild one's society, how to regain one's right, and how to regain a shred of dignity. It took a long time for large segments of the Palestinian public to actually be able to take seriously the idea that maybe the answer to their, to, to, to the, to their, to their problem can lie in having a mini-state. That a mini-state, while it will not return their land fully, it will not return their rights, 
it will not give them justice. It will not give them what is due to them. Justice, injustice will remain done to them. They will remain the victims of oppression. They will remain people who have been dispossessed and dispersed. But that they might be able to find a way to live with a shred of dignity if there were to be a state in a small part of their country, 22% of their country. طبعا لازم يجب ان تعترف بالدوله الفلسطينيه ولكن ضمن حقوقنا يعني انه ما تروح حقوق يعني حاليا حسب ما قرات انه 22% فقط من فلسطين هي اللي داخل فلسطين فاحنا شو بدنا بدوله 22% من دولتنا الاصليه انا ارى انه يجب على الامم المتحده الاعتراف بالدوله الفلسطينيه لانه عندما قامت طلبت الدوله الحكومه الفلسطينيه الاعتراف بالدوله الفلسطينيه افترضوا او وجدوا لهم مجموعه من المتطلبات للوصول الى الاعتراف بالدوله منها المؤسسات الامنيه والمؤسسات والوزارات وغيرها، وعند الوصول الى هذه الافكار وقيام السلطه الوطنيه مجهود على شكورها على مجهودها انه بتعزيز هذه المؤسسات وبنائها وتعزيزها من خلال المؤسسات الامنيه والوزارات وغيرها، لجانا الى الامم المتحده للاعتراف بعد تحقيق المتطلبات التي عملت اسرائيل على اجهادها والقضاء عليها من خلال الجهود الدبلوماسيه التي تقوم بها السلطه الوطنيه الفلسطينيه، لان اسرائيل عندما بدات قيام دولتها قامت بنفس الطريقه. The United Nations General Assembly, which helped to create the State of Israel, now elects her a member nation. Assembly President Abbott announces formally declare Israel admitted to membership in the United Nations. Although Britain abstained from voting, congratulations are showered on Israel's Foreign Minister Moshe Sharet from all the delegates. The young republic, born of war, now joins the Council of Peace. The blue and white star of David is added to the flags of the 58 other member states. Uh, Israel declared statehood unilaterally in 1948, yes, based on 181. It was turned down first, it applied again, it was accepted conditionally, uh, provided it would implement UN Resolution 181 and 194, uh, referring to the return of Palestinian refugees. Uh, to us, uh, I mean, the UN has always been the source of international legitimacy, international law, but also the home of the international community. So we are going back to the UN in order to say we are a nation among nations. We want our rights to be recognized, to be protected, to be preserved, because obviously under occupation, Israel has been carrying out all sorts of prejudicial measures that are destroying the Palestinian state, destroying its viability. To go to the UN means that the territory that Israel is occupying is occupied territory, not disputed that Jerusalem is illegally annexed by Israel. It is uh, occupied territory. East Jerusalem is our capital. And we think that any resolution has to be based on international law. I believe that these things, that this is a distraction, that what matters is reality, and getting declarations from the UN changes nothing on the ground. And I think that um, it, it it ultimately is a gift to Israel by setting borders that, uh, in a sense, relinquish the rights of the rest of the Palestinians and the refugees. Of course, Israel is making a big fuss about it, but uh, uh, at the end of the day, I think the risk is that uh, it, you know, it's as if we're saying, well, we couldn't create a real Palestinian state, so let's pretend to have one. We'll just go to the UN and, and declare one anyway. Uh, and, and this is meaningless on the ground. So I'm, I'm very skeptical and I think it distracts from real efforts to change the power equation. Going to the UN is not a meaningless gesture. It is taking the Palestinian cause and placing it, placing it squarely uh, and firmly within international law and within the international community. We are saying this is not our creation. This is the creation again of the international community. We have the right to self-determination. We have to get the protection of the law, of international law, and Israel has to be held accountable. And of course, our territory has to be recognized as the 1967 boundaries, as occupied territory. Jerusalem has to be recognized as our capital. And so in a way, it is putting a limit to Israeli expansionism and to the Israeli discourse. 
that has shaped so far all the attempts at peacemaking, the, pe the endless peace process. So in a sense, no, it is not meaningless. It has symbolic value. It can be a gesture. It can tell people that the Palestinians, that you are not abandoned, you are not alone. But it has very concrete results. And it also enables us to reach the international community, all the agencies, all the organizations of the UN, which would enable us to hold Israel accountable to pursue it uh, judicially in terms of uh, legal accountability. This is extremely important to us because obviously Israel has not listened to anybody, including the requests by the sponsors of peace, including the quartet, including its own friends. Uh, and insists on creating these unilateral facts and destroying the chances of peace. It is time that the world decides that there has to be some sort of engagement and intervention to prevent Israel from thrusting the whole region into a whole new cycle of violence and extremism. Actually, if we are speaking about history, uh, it's worthwhile reminding people here that on December 15th, 1988, the Palestinians already went to the General Assembly and already got a resolution for a Palestinian state. 104 countries supported that. Only two voted against that, the United States and Israel, and nothing. The Palestinians did not receive state because of that, and that will clearly be the case in September if they go again to, this, to the uh, General Assembly uh, of the UN they should understand and the word should clarify to them that if they want a state and we want them to have a state they should sit and negotiate directly with the Israelis. I am afraid that the, uh, the fact that they want to go to the uh, General Assembly of the UN will lead to more confrontations because people will see that they have not received anything in the day after. So I don't know the results of this uh, thing. It's basically a very interesting tactic decision that has um, you know, pros and cons. But uh, as, as an Israeli activist that is struggling together with Palestinians, it's really interesting to see how it corners all the propaganda machine of, uh, of the um, right-wing Israeli government uh, around the world to become uh, more and more pathetic. But not all critics of Israel agree with the current Palestinian bid for statehood. Embodied in their objection is a concept known as the One State Solution, a proposal in which the entire territory of historic Palestine would be united in a single, secular, democratic state with equal rights for Jews and Arabs alike. I prefer one state for all, one country for all. Quality, justice, for all. No borders, no two states, one state, one heart, can carry three children. But if we have one state, they will have to have civil rights, and then we have more Arabs and Jews. And this is the greatest fear of, of Jewish Israelis. Even the left, the most left, the majority, you know, to lose demographically. This is the, the, the fiercest fear. Usually what you hear in the Zionist left is separation. Separation, two-state solution, and everybody speaks about it very lightly and comfortably because they know it's impossible now. Israel made it impossible to have a Palestinian state. So everybody talks about two-state solution very, you know, they feel very liberal, but uh, I believe that, you know, at the end you will have one state with an Arab majority, Jewish minority, and uh, this is what this place is. And this is also another important to realize, thing to realize. Everything Israel has done, for example, since 1948, and then again since 1967, or continued after 1967, is to make the partition of Palestine impossible and to create facts on the ground which make Israeli domination irreversible. This is really, really important. That's why the boycott, divestment, and sanctions are so important. Because everything Israel does is to make it so that the Israeli domination of the entire land and the people is irreversible. And that, of course, when you see it in that light, you understand the ethnic cleansing, and you understand the brutal policies against the Palestinians. Everything suddenly makes sense when you see it in that light, and you understand the real purpose behind what they're doing. 
Um, so how the UN votes, I think, is immaterial. I think it might be symbolically could be could be seen as a Palestinian victory if the vote goes for the Palestinians. So Israel will probably consider it as a as a, a victory if if the vote goes their way. But on the ground, in terms of how Palestinians are treated, in terms of resolving the Israeli-Palestinian issue, this is completely insignificant. But uh, the increase of number of settlers in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, the building of that horrendous, monstrous wall, the, 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 the subdivision and the fracturing of Palestinian territory, the physical fracturing of Palestine. Uh, you know, you look at that and you say, See, we're not, that's not going towards the state. If somebody looked at that and said, let me try to predict where the trend is, the trend is not towards anything that looks like a Palestinian state. So anybody in their right mind looking at what's going on on the ground will have to arrive at that conclusion. Is that irreversible? Is that inevitable? You know, nothing is inevitable as long as there is human will if it is the product, if it is a human artifice. The wall is the product of human doing. The settlements are the product of human doing. What humans do, they can reverse. But it would take a, it would take a very concerted will on the part of Israelis to reverse this. And they seem to indicate nothing but the opposite will. The will not to make that possible. So, people who are sober-minded, very looking at the ground and seeing what's looking in front of them and saying, let me take my cue from what the world looks like on the ground, invariably conclude this is not leading to a state. This thing is not realizable. The people who support the one-state solution are really, I think, uh, people with uh, more uh, communist orientation or what is called the lunatic left in Israel. Uh, my opinion is that it's not up to me to decide. It's up to the Palestinians to decide what they want. There are other visions, as I said, people uh, often talk about a one-state solution, and I don't want to criticize that vision because it is a beautiful vision. It is a vision in which you imagine the Israeli people and the Palestinian people from within themselves overcoming their past, overcoming their conflict, and saying, we will live as equal citizens. What is unsaid in the articulation of that vision we will erase our identity as we now understand it. We will be different people. We will no longer think of ourselves as Palestinians. We will become something else. We will no longer think of ourselves as Israelis. We will become something else. These things have happened in human history, but it's something that monumental you would have to await for the one state solution to be something other than a beautiful and very admirable dream. In a world that resembles our own, that is structured by the territorial state, in which human beings organize themselves and identify themselves along national lines, the one state solution is very difficult to imagine. So, sadly, we find ourselves between a beautiful but unrealizable vision in the world we know and a less beautiful and also unrealizable vision, but with a little bit more possibility of realizability. What would be the parameters of a sovereign Palestine? And how could it be successful if it did exist? Well, I think uh, what I'm striving for, what I've been striving for all my life, is to have an independent, sovereign Palestine that is genuinely democratic, that has a real system of good governance based on the rule of law, based on respect for its citizens' uh, rights and fundamental freedoms. And this state has to be pluralistic, it has to be inclusive, it has to be tolerant, it has to be a contemporary uh, civil state uh, that interacts with others on the basis of equality, with common uh, perceptions and values that are universal, like human rights and so on. So it is the state that we are struggling for. Of course, the boundaries are the 67 boundaries. We cannot afford to give away more land. We've already compromised to accept only 22% of historical Palestine. And Israel insists it wants to annex even more uh, of those boundaries. 
which means the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, which will be our capital, and of course the Gaza Strip. Uh, these would be our boundaries. And economically, the, I mean, no state, however large or small, can exist in isolation. We have to exist within regional uh, frames of cooperation, of agreement, of mutual interest, and good neighborly relations. Because as the whole world is moving towards the multilateralism and regional agreements and cooperation, we uh, are creating states that are isolated, like Israel is, is really a garrison state. It is a state that builds walls around itself and between itself and the neighbors and so on. No, we need to tear down walls. We need to create uh, situations of mutual cooperation and respect and mutual benefit. One vision of a dynamic and prosperous Palestine comes from a small town on the California coast. The, uh, the ARC project began back in 2003 when two private donors uh, who were affiliated, associated with uh, RAND Corporation, a research institution here in Santa Monica, approached RAND separately with an interest in funding two studies about a prospective Palestinian state. Uh, the first study would look at the broader question of what would a Palestinian state, if one were created, need to succeed? And the second study was focused more on the, infra the physical infrastructure that a state would need, transportation, housing, and so forth. Um, one of the conclusions of the study was that if a Palestinian state uh, I is going to succeed, Gaza and the West Bank would have to be a single territorial entity, which means that they would need a, some form of linkage. And a link has been part of every diplomatic agreement since uh, Oslo in the form of what are called safe passage roads. One of the main benefits is connecting the places where people live and work. That's a basic principle of cities around the world. For people to have jobs and to take care of their families, go to school, they need to be able to move uh, freely and easily between, uh, between cities. That's what the ARC infrastructure does. It allows uh, relatively rapid movement north to south between the major cities, but also with connections to very good bus service running east and west to smaller cities and the outskirts of the primary towns. Generally, our work as urban designers is focused on helping uh, people enjoy the maximum benefits they can from living in cities in different parts of the world. And the principles that we applied in Palestine, in a way, were no different than we applied to projects anywhere else in the world. We made a huge assumption that a peace accord uh, had been signed, that a new state had been formed, and then asked the question, what's the way to optimize the land, the cities, and the people, and the human resources? to create the best chances for success in that new state. So that's how we approach the problem, not, not politically, not with, a, with an agenda, but trying to problem solve with a, with a very, to be sure, an optimistic set of assumptions. But those, uh, there will have to be a peace accord if a new state is to come into existence and, and enjoy a, the possibility of success. And, and we hope that happens uh, very soon. The wall has to come down. This wall is a punitive wall. It, it, it is one of the most horrible, uh, repugnant expressions of power and control and separation and annexation. It is really an apartheid wall. It just looks, if you look at it and it's so gray and, and foreboding and ugly, it's something that has to come down. Uh, it's again a unilateral measure. Building walls between peoples is, is really a way of preparing for further distrust, hostilities, and conflict, and violence. So I think it should go down precisely because it's built on Palestinian land. It's not even built on the borders. And it, not only does it deprive us of our freedom, of our horizon, of our right to see beyond the, the wall, the here and now, it also imprisons the Israelis behind that wall and prevents them from seeing the consequences of the occupation of what's happening to the Palestinians, and therefore they lack the tools of de dealing with reality. So it has to come down. The settlements, of course, are illegal. There is no such thing as a legal settlement, because a settlement is a, a, a process of colonization, of land theft, of expulsion, what uh, Elan Pape called the displacement replacement paradigm. You displace a whole nation and you replace it with another, and you take their land, you take their resources, including water, and now they're confiscating our culture as well. 
uh, in addition to expelling Palestinian people. So we know we will not accept the, the displacement replacement paradigm. We will not accept the expulsion and ID uh, revocation or confiscation of Palestinians. And we will not accept the superimposition of an illegal reality on our territory based on land theft and importation of populations into Palestine. The settlements have to be dismantled. If there are Israelis who want to be uh, who want to stay in Palestine as individuals, they may apply in accordance with our uh, laws of immigration and naturalization. The state of Palestine would be occupied and the state of Palestine would simply be calling, negotiating how its occupying power is going to leave. If Israeli settlers would be interested in staying, well, as I've heard many times mentioned by other people, they can apply through the immigration, naturalization and <laughs> procedures that would exist within a Palestinian state. And according to whatever these procedure, whatever procedures are, they can either be allowed to stay or not. Pay taxes. They wouldn't be able to hog 40% of the territory. They wouldn't be able to hog all the water that, that they sit on and use. How would refugees fare if Palestine becomes an independent state? And how would it affect the Palestinian citizens of Israel? Now, Palestinians are, you know, divided into those who live in the West Bank and Gaza, some of whom are refugees and some of whom are from there. Those who live in, uh, in, 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 in the part of historic Palestine that became Israel, as, as yet another group, and those living in the other Arab countries. A two-state solution based on the 1967 lines is one that addresses some of the grievance, some of the needs and interests of the population living in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza. It would only indirectly deal and help, the, deal with and help the Palestinians who are refugees in other Arab countries. And it does nothing for the Palestinians living inside Israel. So it's not surprising that those for whom the two-state solution does not directly address their grievance will not be enthusiastic about it. I've heard people saying, you know, what's the point getting a Palestinian state recognized in the UN? That won't give us a state on the ground. Yes, it's true, it won't. But there is such a thing as legal reality. Yeah? L l we, can, we can speak just as, as, as corporations are legal persons. Yeah, they're not really persons, like they're not natural persons, they're legal persons. Similarly, and that gives them a reality in the world that they wouldn't have if they were not recognized as legal persons. Similarly, there is a legal reality that can be given to Palestine as a state if it is a full member of the United, of the United Nations that it wouldn't have if it is not. We're talking here symbolic, we're talking one step, but it would, be a, it would have been a step or would be a step in the right direction if you value a two-state solution. If you think a two-state solution was disastrous, and you think it should have never been a, a Palestinian political platform, then you might celebrate the fact that the United, Na the United States will be vetoing this and will stop Palestine from becoming a member of the UN. I find that sad, but I know that that's the case for some people. Yeah. For the Palestinians, efforts to delegitimize Israel will end in failure. Symbolic actions to isolate Israel at the United Nations in September won't create an independent state. Administration views uh, the effort, the Palestinian effort at the UN as 
an effort to de delegitimize Israel. Could you explain to us why such an effort or such a move would delegitimize the state of Israel? Uh, again, I think you know where we stand on this issue. I don't think I can improve on the comments that we've made from this podium over the last week that the Secretary herself has made, that the President has made, that we think the best way forward for these parties is to come back to the table and negotiate this through. I guess what I'm trying to do is really explain to my readers as to why this is viewed as a process to delegitimize the state. So could you just help me understand as to why is it perceived as such? As we said a number of times, uh, the day after any action in the, in the UN, you haven't changed the fundamental situation. And what we are seeking to do is to get to a place where we can have two states living side by side in peace and security. And action in New York is not going to achieve that objective, as we said many times. The United States believes that negotiations should result in two states with permanent Palestinian borders with Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, and permanent Israeli borders with Palestine. We believe the borders of Israel and Palestine should be based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps so that secure and recognized borders are established for both states. The Palestinian people must have the right to govern themselves and reach their full potential in a sovereign and contiguous state. Now, irrationality is not uncommon in politics. Yeah? Contradiction is not uncommon in politics. But sometimes the irrationality and the contradiction is so blatant that even the casual observer cannot miss it. And I think this is going to be one of those instances. President Obama gives a speech in May saying, that the parameters of an Israeli-Palestinian peace are on the basis of the 1967 lines with agreed upon land swaps. He comes, he comes and makes that statement himself. He says that's the standard. Palestinians take him at his word and say, okay, we're asking for no more, merely the recognition of a state of Palestine on the basis of the 1967 borders, and if you want to put in brackets with agreed, you know, with agreed land swaps, we can do that. How does the United States justify to itself, to the world, just, I mean, in, their, in, in, in policymakers, how do they justify in their own heads how they veto their own statements? How do you veto your own position? How do you vote against what you yourself proposed? The problem is the two-state solution is an unjust solution, but still we can't even get there. That's how ridiculous and surreal everything um, is. So, when Palestinians ask for a state for full membership of, a Palestine, of Palestine in the United Nations on the borders of 1967, they are asking for what the whole world agrees they should have, even the United States, even those who will vote against them agree. That's the weirdness of it. Well, my dream is to have an independent country of Palestine, to be admitted to the United Nations as hopefully we have 193 countries now. Wouldn't it be nice if the UN General Assembly voted to grant statehood and Palestine would become the 194th country in the world. Starting in January 2011, I have not known in my memory, and I don't think in the memory of my parents' generation, I don't think they have known the whole world looking at the Arab world in admiration. I have not felt that in my life. That level, that sense that the world truly admires us. The world thinks we're not only we're doing something right, the world can be inspired by what Arabs are doing. To, to see 
demonstrators in the streets of Tel Aviv saying we were inspired by the Arab Spring. Who thought they, could ever, they would ever hear that? This is a very unusual moment in modern Arab history. This is the moment of empowerment and dignity. When Palestinians who share in that sense, even though they haven't had their own Arab Spring. They haven't had their own popular movement in this last year. Of course, Palestinians have had many popular movements. They had it in 36, they had it in 87, they had it in 2000. But now they're not, they haven't participated in this in any big way. But they participate in the feeling. They share in that sense of pride and dignity that is shared by everybody who feels connected to the Arabic-speaking world. In this atmosphere, to make a demand for one's rights, to say, we, whom the world admires, we stand with dignity, demanding our right. We're not asking for a handout, not asking for charity. We stand with pride and dignity, asking for what is ours, what all of you have acknowledged for years is ours. We demand it now. That moment is not going to be recreated. And on September 20th, I'm waiting for that moment. Me and my family and my friends and my acquaintances were waiting for that moment. And I hope and I pray God that it will happen. Because we deserve it. I think we're on the verge of seeing that territorially, uh, Israel is rendering the Palestinian state not viable because it is stealing more land, it is building more settlements or colonies, it is bringing in more Israeli settlers illegally, it is blurring the divide between the two states, and it is destroying the viability, territorial viability of the Palestinian state. I still believe that if there is a political will and if there is the determination to intervene and to engage positively, we can still rescue the two-state solution. But it's a very slim chance because Israel has been given time and cover to continue with its destructive path. Now, if, if there is no will to, to act with a sense of urgency and immediacy, then it, se it seems to me the two-state solution, yes, will be destroyed. That means that we will stay in this very abnormal situation for generations, maybe, under occupation where Israel acts unilaterally, where it steals the land without the people, the one-state solution isn't going to emerge easily or as a result of a political program because Israel will reject it and will use its own logic of power to continue to create prejudicial facts uh, with the Palestinians, to take the land without the people as much as it wants to do that, and to expand Israel because Israel has no boundaries, has no constitution. It, it just expands as it goes along. So that is the real danger to peace, because without the two-state solution, there's going to be greater conflict, greater violence, greater extremism. Without a just resolution, of course, the whole region, if not the globe, will pay the price.